All right, so um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Iron Hack for giving me the opportunity to share my experience with you guys. This is something that I love to do. I love giving back to the community, and this is where I am today. So the I, need, I need to be very careful with this thing. I'm going to fall here a couple of times. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the 10 heuristics uh, great designers have in common. So some of them uh, Milan already mentioned, which is very interesting. But first thing, uh, this is my Twitter handle if you guys want to follow me. Um, I want to ask here, who wants to be a designer? Really, who's sleeping? Who needs energy? All right, so I'm going to start asking questions. Oh, Andy's here. Good morning, Andy. All right, so um, hello, good to see you. <laughs> All right, I want to ask you, why are you here today? I am here to learn about UX and to transition from traditional research to all the cool stuff you do. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. And why are you guys here? The same. The same. <laughs> so it sounds, sounds like a common pattern. Are you here to learn about user experience? Okay. So let's assume what I just did was a simple research, right? That's what we do as designers. We try to understand the audience. Actually, this wasn't part of the talk at all. But <laughs> so I help startups uh, building cross-functional teams uh, designers, developers, I help them with the strategy, and uh, this is something that I, that I love the most. I have a background as a, as a developer, and as a graphic designer, and nowadays I'm a product designer. I'm currently working for Ultima Software. I have to plug this company. This is the best company to work for, not only in South Florida, but in a Fortune 100 company. So. And I share my knowledge. I love giving back through the Interaction Design Association. I have my partner in crime, Joe Mina, here. So make sure you sign up on meetup.com slash IXDA-Miami. Right. And next month, I'm going to be starting a new meetup, which is Sketch on Thursdays. It will be the first. Uh, Thursday of every month. I'm working on a set uh, venue to uh, host this. So, and you can go meetup.com slash sketch dash 305. Very good. So I've already asked this question. I want to be a great designer, right? Who wants to become a great designer? Come on, I need your participation, right? So you don't want to become a great designer? Possibly. Do you believe that you can become a great designer? Possibly. Okay. We can all become a great designer. But before we do that, we need to figure out what the hell design is, right? We don't know. We don't know. We only know what great design is over time. When we look back and we say, wow, that was a great design. That designer designed something and is still on today and we still use and enjoy. That's one of the aspects of a great design. So in order for us to do this, I'm going to invite you to understand how they think and why are they considered great designers. It happens that William uh, Lidwell He's a designer, he's an author, and he's also, he used to be a professor at the Houston University. And he wrote, along with uh, three, uh, two other designers, the universal principles of design. So I'm going to give one of you this pocket book today. This book is amazing. That's every designer should have this on their desk, right? It has all the very uh, techniques and heuristics that we use. Speaking of heuristics, 
Yeah, this thing does skip, right? So what he did is he had the same question. So he decided to research. You know, being in academia, that's what they like to do. As a designer, what he did is he compiled a list of 277 uh, designers. And um, you know, that, that goes uh, ranging as architects, as uh, graphic designers, as engineers, as inventors. So he compiled this 277 list. What he did after, well, it took him a few years. He read every paper, everything that these people, there's a raccoon walking outside. That's so cool. <laughs> Every paper, everything that these people wrote, he read it. And he went further. He also read and listened and watched everything that anyone has talked or written about these designers. Why he did that? He wanted to understand that each time a technique that they used uh, was mentioned, he would note it. Right? So, um, I'll give you an example here. All right, so what he did is he listed great designers uh, on, uh, on the left, and then he, he, he listed all the heuristics. So, every technique is a heuristic, right? It's a methodology, it's a rule of thumb, something that they use. And they would, he would mark, okay, this designer used this, this designer used that. What he did is he identified common uh, heuristics that all designers, all great designers would use. So as a researcher, now he has a sample that he can use to identify uh, how great designers think. Are you guys with me? Does this make sense? Okay. All right, so he came up with 10 heuristics. Uh, you know, heuristics, I already said, it's an approach to problem solving, learning, or discovery that employs a practical method, right? So heuristic is on the third level of knowledge, like skills. Skills is very hard, right? It takes years for you to master a skill, to become an expert on something, to become a craftsman. And heuristic is something simple that you learn and you practice a couple of times and then you can apply and naturally, right? So that's what heuristics are. The first heuristic is elegant simplicity over conspicu conspicuous uh, futurism. So companies love to do the bottom, right? They love to create a list of features and put on a, on a features matrix on a website. If you buy uh, you know, if you sign up now, you get this short list, which is free. Then you can add a ten, uh, $10 subscription for these additional features. But if you really want to use the advanced uh, uh, portion of my product, here's a full list of features that you can use. But you actually only need what you get for free, right? So that's uh, futurism. And elegant simplicity is give to the user what they want for, right? what they really want. So I'll give a couple of examples of designers. Uh, does everyone know, uh, probably know, Raymond Lowry, right? This guy is considered the father of industrial designer. If I can list the things that this guy did, he created the Shell logo, he uh, designed the Air Force One, he designed the U.S. Post Office logo. Um, trains, he really created like the most futuristic way of uh, shape of a uh, locomotive. Right. So I can go on and on. He, he worked on uh, Studebaker, the car, right? The, the old cars that had the futuristic shape, he created that. He also wrote a book. So after, work, after working in all of these uh, sectors and having the experience uh, over the years, uh, he compiled a number of research 
And uh, this, uh, this book is one, actually it's one of the heuristics of uh, these findings, is never leave well enough alone. So the idea is that design is never finished. It's never perfect. You always have to come back and make it better, and make it better, and make it better. The most interesting stuff from this book is that he compiled this for a number of industries. So you have the automobile industry, you have the rail car, telephone, clocks, chairs, uh, you know, stemware, dress, and bathing suit. <laughs> and over time, what he identified was that we are just shape, uh, shaving things off over and over, over and over. He started his career as a uh, functionalist. So he would think that every feature should be in a design uh, solution. And over the years, he aimed for the simplicity. So a good design is when you can find the medium to what your users need right now. Right? I'll give you an example. If I decided that I'm going to redesign this microphone, do I really need a microphone that's this big? All right. But if I give a microphone that you can put on a sticker here, do you think people would understand as a, as a microphone? Probably not. Maybe it's too futuristic for today. Right? Because we are still adapted to holding microphones. So my goal as a designer is to rethink microphones in a way that's not too futuristic and it's not too old, it's not too current. So I'm always improving this a little bit towards the future. That was his end of life uh, realization. We have Dieter Rams, uh, he's a product designer for Brown. He's very well known in this industry. Um, his designs is copied by Apple, shameless. And so he went straight to the simplicity. He didn't want to deal with, uh, with uh, shaving things off and over time, he said, no, screw that. Let's, let's just create the most simplest form of anything. And that's what Brown did. Beautiful design. Today's beautiful design. But people then didn't think that was practical. They were used to heavy things, to the uh, number of buttons. You know, skip a couple here. So you can see how the brown design, it's, you know, it just uh, uh, goes for simplicity. Another one was Coco Chanel, right? Coco Chanel, there's a quote there, simplicity is the keynote of all true elegance. You have to remember when Coco Chanel uh, decided to reinvent fashion, people used to wear dresses like this. And she didn't want to do that. She wanted to feel comfortable in 1920. So this is about 1920 when Chanel uh, came, right? So you see the difference from the previous uh, slide, right? That was her approach. But here's the issue. That's another one by uh, Chanel. So here's the issue with uh, Chanel. In 1920, people were used to dress uh, like with a very heavy dress. They wanted to, to show detail. And that took time to take off. The same way with brown uh, designs, it took time to take off, right? But you look at any brown device today, you want to have it because now you are adapted to the notion that simplicity is good. I'm, I'm going back. <laughs> All right. 
So this is called progressive uh, reduction, and Apple does that very well. I'll show you the way the iMac in 1998 was and how the iMac is today. So you can see how they were shaving things off, becoming simple, becoming simple. And they did that on purpose. They didn't want to go from there to here immediately. It would turn people off, right? So they created a strategy of pro progressive reduction. I have another slide uh, on this later on. The second heuristic was inside out uh, craftsmanship over bait and switch craftsmanship. So IKEA is a good example of the, the opposite, right? If you look at IKEA uh, furniture uh, from the front, you see that's pretty good. But if you turn around, you see a, like a very cardboard type of uh, uh, back, right? Very cheap, yeah. But there's a price for that, right? So you're willing to pay for that price. But if you want something with quality, you don't want to see the cardboard in the, in the back, right? You want something that will last. So inside out uh, craftsmanship goes not only in devices that you design, it goes in things that you do. Right. Steve Jobs uh, has a story where his father uh, asked him to, to build a fence. And uh, he, he said, well, let's, let's put, just put a fence on the front, which is a nice material. And in the backyard, we just put like a, a wood fence. And it wouldn't look good. But yeah, no one will see anyways. And then his father told him, well, but you will know that the crappy fence is in the backyard. So that stuck with him. And everything that he did from that day on, he wanted to have everything so well shaped, so well designed. That's craftsmanship, right? So you can see the, the Mac Pro. And if you open a Mac Pro, you see the elegance, the beauty of the, the motherboard. All right. So what I like about this also, like I said, it's not about a thing that you design. It's everything that you do. So you talk about sketch, right? My sketch files, I like to be well named. If anyone, if any other designer takes uh, uh, my sketch file and opens, they will see, wow, the backyard fence is also nice, right? So that's, uh, that goes for the way you feel about the things that you do. It's not only the things that you produce. Every step of the way, be a craftsmanship, or be a craftsman. The third one is embrace failure, right? Over fearing failure. So Thomas Edison uh, is a good, ex uh, perfect example of this, right? Someone asked him, you have failed 1,000 times trying to find a single light, light bulb. And his response is, was that, no, I haven't just uh, uh, failed. I found 1,000 ways that won't work. So you're always evolving on the things that we do. We as product designers, we do prototypes, like he, uh, Mila mentioned Envision. Uh, Envision is just that. So we create uh, the interface on Sketch, and then we push to Envision as a prototype. We link and we fake the product before we spend tons of hours and money developing. With that prototype, we can go on and research, validate with the end users. Right? So how do you think about this? What is that label? Does that mean anything to you? Uh, is the, are the colors that have enough contrast for you if you are colorblind? So that gives uh, enough means to validate that we are going in the right direction. James Dyson, he's the inventor of um, uh, the cyclonic vacuum. And I have to connect this. Okay. So James Dyson, he actually, he didn't fail. 
Okay, so now I get to sing acoustic version. All right, so he talks about failing uh, thousands of times in prototypes. Um, the fourth one is never leave uh, well enough alone. So that's from uh, uh, Raymond's uh, uh, book. If it, the, the opposite of that is if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? Most companies, or great designers, I'm not going to talk about the other guys, great designers never go for the if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? They always try to go back at it and improve it. So here's the book. If you guys want to take a picture, this is an amazing book. If you are an aspiring designer, if you want to become a designer, you should have, first, first thing you have to do is go to Ikea and buy a very cheap uh, uh, bookshelf for 40 bucks and put behind your desk, right? Just so when you do podcasts and you do like video conference, you see the bookshelf behind you. And then you start buying these books. Because these books are a great reference, right? So you put on that, on that shelf. So uh, there'll be a number of, uh, you know, over the, the course of your learning, you will see all these books. I recommend that you create a Pinterest board and take a photo and put all the books that you need to buy, just so you don't lose it. All right, so here's a, a good example of that heuristic, right? Desi design is never perfect. It's always evolving. So this is a project that, well, Raymond was uh, uh, involved in Coca-Cola's product design. So you can see how the Coca-Cola uh, bottle shape has been improving over time, but always uh, maintaining that branding, the, 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 the shape aspect of Coca-Cola's uh, visual language. Another example here, which I already showed, but what I'm showing now is the course of the change. In 2000, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, they created uh, uh, the iMac, right? Two years after, they completely reshaped from scratch the iMac, and they created the, 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 the swivel arm uh, display. Two years after, they redid everything over. That's crazy. Can you think, we're talking about very high technology, very difficult to, to manufacture uh, products. This is very expensive, but he was bold enough to take the company towards that direction. And the, what you can remember here is that they were just about to introduce the iPhone. They had the iPod touch, right? And so they were aligning the visual language of Apple's uh, product line to be the same. Can you imagine if they would, they would launch uh, iPhone? The iPhone, they still have that shape of iMac. Can you think about that? It's fascinating, right? The vision of this guy. So reframing problems over accepting uh, problems. I forgot, the, I think it's on a fifth uh, heuristic. This is also a very good way. If you want to become a great designer, reframe the problems. You're always going to find new ways to solve, uh, to find solutions. So imagine we, we all work for the same company. And someone comes and says, hey, we need uh, to design or sell more uh, drill bits. So that mindset tells us that people want drill bits. That's accepting a problem statement, right? But someone from the design team says, do people really want drill bits? What do they want? They want to make holes. People want holes. That's all they want. They want holes. We all want holes, right? 
Um, but then comes someone and say, no, they don't want holes. They don't want real bits. They want to hang pictures. And they come up with a new solution. That's uh, an example of reframing the problem. Always ask why. So there is a, a rule of thumb. So reframe the problem to innovate, right? Ask why five times. So this is very common nowadays. We ask why for everything. I think we learned that from our children. So here's another example of reframing uh, the problems, right? Why do people want prosthetic feet? Do they want feet? Or do they want to look better? Do they want to feel better, right? And that comes a company and says, oh, let's reframe that problem. People don't want feet. They want to look better. They know that they, you know, if I go with a fake feet, everyone will see, oh, that's fake. It's kind of weird, right? I embrace that and I innovate. I, want to I don't have a feet, but I want to look cool, right? There's a whole new industry uh, segment doing 3D printing, uh, you know, innovating uh, prosthetics. This is fascinating. It's beautiful, right? All right. So here's another way to reframe a problem. People wearing helmets, right? Uh, do people really want to wear helmets to protect uh, their heads? Or do they want to be safe and feel comfortable? Right? So you can think of this company reframing the problem and creating an airbag that you don't have to wear a helmet. Right? That's the power of reframing a problem. How cool is that? Right? The sixth heuristic is Cosman doesn't know what, uh, what is right. Over Cosman is always right. So granted, Marshall Fields, he was in retail, and uh, he came with us. And really, so maybe what he wanted to say is that Cosman was not always right. But we need to make right for the customer. When some, if, you are, if, you are work, if you work in retail and you deal with the customer and the customer comes and complains, do you want to tell, no, you're always right? Or do you want, no, I want to make sure that I'm going to make right for you. That's what he was saying, right? But people took that in a, in a wrong context. Um, to Henry Ford, right? Customer doesn't know what they want, they, they want right? There's a... Uh, a very famous quote by, by well, I was going to uh, talk about Henry Ford here. Someone asked, if I were to ask people uh, what do they want in, in the early 1900s, they would say, I want a faster horse. Right? So people attribute this quote to Henry Ford, but <laughs> there's no documentation that he ever said that. And um, so, but I do know uh, uh, Dean Kamen. Uh, I used to live in, in uh, New Hampshire, and I used to take my son to his building to do robotics, like the Lego robotics uh, competition. And he's an amazing guy. So he's a, a person, an inventor, that, um, that if you ask him what do people want, say, oh, no, they don't, they don't know what they want, right? So what he did over here is instead of asking people with uh, uh, movement disability to ask them what they want about their wheelchair, they would probably ask, oh, I want a bigger cup holder, right? And what he did is, let me take this problem to my engineers. I'm not going to ask uh, the, the, the users what they want, because they probably don't know what we are capable of doing. Instead, I'm going to put my engineering team to uh, work on a wheelchair for months. So that's what he did. So the engineers started thinking, oh my God, I keep looking up to everyone, right? 
and he came up with this idea. They came up with, the team came up with this idea. Well, what if we create a, a, a wheelchair that puts the, the person on the same eye level of, of you know, a companion, right? It's very hard to, to go up on a hill uh, on a wheelchair. So this wheelchair is capable of going up on a hill, uh, uh, climbing uh, stairs. Analogical insights versus analytical thing. This is, nowadays, everyone is about big data, data analysis, right? And, but great designers, they don't pay much attention to that. They always are uh, creating analogies and how they can improve things. So I'm not sure, I don't remember who comes after. Okay, so this is um, um, a designer who was in Italy and he was having calamari. And he started sketching on this, I think it's a placemat or a napkin. He started sketching a new way to, uh, to uh, create a juicer. So this is what he came up with. This is uh, Philip Stark. And this is the things that he, he um, created an analogy uh, from a restaurant that he was eating calamari. And he created a juicer with the shape of calamari. And this was like a very best selling. Uh, and people, you know, there are a lot of functional issues with this. If you squeeze, it will, you know, will, uh, you have juice all over the thing. But then you ask him, well, oh, but this is not really a juicer. This is a way of get people to talk. All right, it's the French way that, that to, to do things. But that's a just a way uh, that great designers create great products by creating analogies wherever you are. Sometimes we go out for dinner and I start sketching things. Like Joe and I, when we go out for dinner, we always, literally, we have, the first thing we say, can I borrow your pen? And then we start sketching the whole thing. <laughs> He's laughing. But that happens many, many times. Uh, Woody Norris. So he's the inventor of a hypersonic speaker. And um, what he did was, he was watching a PBS show and about colors, how uh, if you mix colors, you get other colors, right? especially in a digital uh, format. So you mix light to get different colors. So on a digital display, you only get three colors, the blue, the red, and the green. And by mixing the intensity of these three colors, you get all the other colors. Right? So what he was thinking is, Wait a minute, I can mix the frequency of sound and I can create new frequencies. And he invented the hypersonic speaker. So what this does is, you, that, that's the speaker. If I aim towards this person, she will listen what the speaker is, is uh, uh, emitting, but she won't. It's very hypersonic, it's a laser focus sound by changing the frequency. And all he done was creating an analogy between mixing colors with mixing sound frequencies. Right? There you go, that's how it is. The next heuristic is um, eat your own dog food over observe dogs eating food. Right? So if you're creating a product, Use your own product. Use it. Don't give people to use and watch them using. Right? That's the only way you can learn. So here's a good example. Steve Gass, right? He was, he's a physicist, and he also, he's also the inventor of the saw stop. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, but this is fascinating. Right? So what he does is the, the saw blade, every time it detects a different uh, magnetic field, it stops. So here's another example uh, from the iBot, which follows uh, this uh, uh, heuristic. I'm sorry? 
Yeah, so, no, that was a prototype, but this is also the eat your own, uh, eat your own dog food, right? So he made the engineers use the product just so they could understand, uh, you know, the, what the solution could be. First principles, right, over fashion trends. So we are kind of biased. We all want to go, oh, that person looks that way. I'm going to start looking that way too. Or oh, there's a new way that a community looks and do that. We are very tribal. We tend to go that way, right? Um, but great designers don't tend to follow other people. They look at nature. They look at the, the, the laws of nature to create other solutions. All right, a good example, and this is actually funny. Uh, this is a sea snake, right? Uh, see, everything that's uh, poisonous in nature, it's, it has stripes, it has contrast, right? So if you see a poisonous plant, it's green but has some white dots or yellow spots, right? Uh, this snake is poisonous. And for whatever reason, sharks don't like sea snakes. When they see sea snakes, they don't, they don't go for it, right? And we all know that sharks are colorblind. So I'm not sure if the contrast uh, turned them off, but uh, uh, they don't like it. They won't eat striped things. And here's another example of uh, fishes that are striped fishes swimming next to, to a shark. Shark won't bother them, all right? They don't have to be uh, poisonous. It's another example. But then, there's this tribe in some Melanesian uh, island that they have the sea snake uh, dance. And what the researchers did is, said, why are they using stripes? And they figure out that by uh, striping themselves up, they can go in, in the water and the sharks won't come after them, which led someone to design this, right? It makes sense. This is actually being tested on, uh, on, um, in Australia as um, uh, a shark attack uh, initi initiative. Another good example of looking at nature, principles uh, of laws of nature, uh, to come up with good solutions. So this is obviously Africa, and they have a huge problem with water. So they have actually two problems. The first problem is to find water. The second one is to carry the water, right? And, um, and so we want to look at nature and just create the, a wheel drum, right? Very principle-oriented, uh, right? This is much easier. You can carry a lot more water, and you just pull it, right? Here's another example. Right. And the first, the last uh, heuristic is every great designer, they are very, they are very zealous. They are a zealous missionary. They love to evangelize ideas. They love to speak. They don't love. They learn to speak uh, to public. Right. And this is very important because if you have an idea, you need to learn how to sell it. When you become a designer, you're going to have to learn how to sell it. Don't think that you're going to design things and just going to put, hey, can you try to see if a stakeholder would like this? You have to create the courage to start speaking in front of people. All right? I've seen, uh, uh, I was, uh, let me see if he's here. So <laughs> I, I went to, uh, well, I was talking to a designer, and I was interviewing for, for this company, and I said, wow, really, I think uh, as a team, we need to learn how, how to sell design. So it will be important that the team go out and talk to, uh, to the design community 
Now we do show and tells internally and then we start uh, reaching out to the community to present our work. That will give you some public speaking skills that is extremely important for you to know how to sell uh, design to your own stakeholders. All right. And this is like uh, being a, a, a zealous missionary over an indifferent mercenary. So this is also important because when you don't have the passion for something that you create, you're just doing for money, right? I'm here today, uh, which is a Saturday, and my girlfriend, she will, t she will testify that I didn't sleep much because I love doing this. I'm passionate about giving back to the community. And then you will testify as well, right? I love this. As designers, you need to learn how to give back. Right? And that's a separate presentation that we can do. So great designers uh, have the ability to mobilize people. You must uh, learn how to do this. Here's uh, Walt Disney. Obviously, everyone knows how you would sell a, an idea. And Nikola Tesla, this guy, uh, if you don't know him, he, he was the father of uh, creating the, the alternating current, all right? So everything that we do today, um, like all the, the plugs, that came from his ideas, right? And he, all, he always, and that's funny because if you have the, the newest uh, phones, you can now charge your phone wirelessly, right? That came from his uh, theory. So, but he learned, he was a shy guy, and he learned how to uh, create these spectacles to people. And he became very famous for that, and he really loved it, right? So, Edwin Land from uh, Polaroid, this guy is actually Steve Jobs' uh, hero. This guy, when he would give a presentation about Polaroid cameras, People would just like throw money at him. This guy is amazing, right? And um, so I leave this, this story from Steve Jobs. I think it's so cliche. Every time uh, you want to mention something cool, you mention Steve Jobs. But no, this is actually not about Steve Jobs. This is about Edwin Land. Uh, I always thought of myself as a hum uh, humanities person as a kid, but I liked uh, electronics. Then I read something that one of my heroes, Edwin Land of Polaroid said about the importance of people who could stand at the intersection of humanities and the science. And then I decided that's what I wanted to do, right? So if you can uh, uh, put yourself and mobilize people, uh, so that's what great designers do. And here's the collection of the 10 heuristics that great designs have in common. I have this presentation uh, on Bitly. I'm going to show the link now. And I also, so it's on bit.ly slash uexperience dash mp.